Well, hello, hello, lovely to have you here. In today's video, I want to ask a question about whether our understanding of artificial intelligence and this kind of all these new developments can actually help support our practice, can actually help inform our practice. Uh, recently, I had a question from one of my viewers uh, who asks, uh, would you please make a video about how to deal with nasty, sarcastic voices in your head? And so what I'm going to do in today's video is to sort of take this question in what might be a somewhat unexpected direction and deal with some of what we find around us now in, you know, what's known as chat technology, these chat AI programs, how they work, what we can learn from them, and then circle back around to this question at the end of the video, or near the end of the video, and discuss how all of our understanding and knowledge can actually help inform our practice somewhat and may even deepen our understanding of our own selves, in a sense. This may seem like somewhat of a strange approach, but, but bear with me and I, I think you'll learn something. So how do these uh, chat programs work? Well, they're what's known as artificial neural networks. That is, they are, in a sense, they're modeled on the way the, the brain, the human brain or animal brains work where we have these neurons that are wired together by synapses and basically how we learn, how the human brain uh, learns, is by tweaking uh, the, the, the synaptic weights, the weights between various neurons. Uh, they, they actually, they're, they're, they may be lower weights or higher weights. Now, there's of course much, much more complexity to this, but this is, you know, at a, at a very high uh, view anyway, at a 10,000 foot view here. And the general idea is that, uh, that uh, neurons that fire together wire together. That's the kind of um, uh, somewhat oversimplified statement of how these things work. That when neurons fire at the same time, they tend to get wired together. They reinforce each other. And I think we understand this as well when we come to, to practice, that the more you do something, the more the, the traces of that doing tend to get laid down in the brain and the mind. That's the whole, uh, uh, the whole background, really, uh, of, of Buddhist practice and practice in many other uh, 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 ideas, you know, in many other philosophies as well, Stoicism, uh, Western philosophies as well, is that by repeating uh, the same action over and over, we reinforce that action. That's the whole idea behind, indeed, how these neural networks tend to learn. So when it comes to these large language model artificial intelligences, these neural networks that deal with language, they're fed an enormous amount of uh, data from human language. That is to say, language from, let's say, the internet and other sources that is uh, somewhat culled and, and uh, gone through to try to make sure that it's uh, relatively uh, well-formed and so on. Then it's fed to these models in enormous amounts, and they're trained on it. Uh, basically, they uh, learn how to predict what kinds of words will follow other words in given contexts. And then after that, they're further trained with humans, with actual humans, as well as with other artificial intelligences, uh, to refine the outputs that they give. Uh, so, for example, they're trained to be more concise uh, so that they're not going to give a response that just goes on and on and on forever. Uh, that kind of thing. So they're trained to be useful to humans uh, in various ways. And at the end of this, what they get is, is, is not only good at predicting what kind of words might follow other words, but they get to be better in other ways as well. Now, we may come to ask, what is the relationship between prediction, being able to predict very well, in particular being able to predict what words follow other words, and understanding on the other hand? And the idea, at least with some, by some of the people who design these uh, programs, is that the, the, the distinction between prediction, predictive ability, and understanding somewhat models the difference between an artificial intelligence and, let's say, a human intelligence. Here's what uh, Ilya Sutskever, the head of OpenAI, or the chief scientist in OpenAI, and the lead, really the lead designer of uh, GPT-4, here's what he had to say recently on this topic. I think it's very interesting. Now, the thing that happens here is we need to come back to our original 
assumption that maybe biological neurons aren't that different from artificial neurons. And so if you have a large neural network like this, that guesses the next word really well, maybe it will be not that different from what people do when they speak. And that's what you get. So now when you talk to a neural network like this, it's because it has such a great, such an excellent sense of what comes next, what word comes next. It can narrow down, it can't see the future, but it can narrow down the possibilities correctly from its understanding. Being able to guess what comes next very, very accurately requires prediction, which is the way you operationalize understanding. What does it mean for a neural network to understand? It's hard to come up with a clean answer, but it is very easy to measure and optimize the network's prediction error of the next word. So we say we want understanding, but we can optimize prediction. And that's what we do. So there's a lot to unpack in what he says here, but I think one of the takeaways is that the way that these large language models uh, predict the next word in a sentence is somewhat similar to, indeed maybe very similar to, the way our, act, our brains actually work in producing the language that we produce. Now that's not to say that these are identical, they're doing exactly the same thing, there obviously are going to be differences, but that they're saliently similar, that that is, they're much more similar than we would have thought of before actually undertaking to make these kinds of artificial intelligences. The point is that understanding can be seen as a sort of correct prediction. That is, in order to be able to predict something, such as the next word in a sentence, we really have to understand the context extremely deeply. Uh, Ilya uh, gives an example as well in some of his talks of a, a, a program or a person that is fed, let's say, an entire book. Uh, let's say it's a crime novel. And the question is, we get to the last page of that crime novel where the, the detective is, says, uh, you know, aha, I've discovered the murderer and the murderer is. And then the question is, can the large language model or can the reader predict what those next words are going to be? You could say, oh, it's just a dumb prediction. But the fact is that in order to be able to predict that, we have to have been able to digest and understand the entire novel. We've, ha we've had to be able to understand all of its context, all of the clues that are given in the novel, such that we can predict who the, the, uh, the detective is going to say that the murderer is, or the person who, who, who committed the crime is. So uh, what he's trying to, what Ilya is trying to do with this example is to show that there really isn't a lot of daylight between prediction and under, correct prediction and understanding. In order to be able to do one, you have to be able to do the other. Indeed, in a past video of mine, I cited one of uh, Ilya's conversations where he said that these large language models have to have really what he said, the, the quote is, a shocking degree of understanding of the world as reflected in human language. Clearly, the, these uh, programs are not understanding the world, quote unquote, directly the way we do. They're understanding it through the, the lens of human descriptions of the world, which is obviously a big difference. So we're not talking about exactly the same thing. However, we might uh, want to consider that humans ourselves learn language in a somewhat similar way to the way these uh, programs do. Now, again, there are going to be significant differences. We, uh, when we're uh, ch children, when we're babies, learn language with a lot of context around us, whereas these chat programs only learn the language itself without the context, and so they require much, much more language uh, to, to, to actually learn how to speak than we do. However, and here's the, the point that I want to focus on, we can perhaps think of our minds, our brains, as containing something like chatbots within us that produce the language that we actually speak or that we actually think. Now, of course, there are going to be key differences, as I've already said, as I've said in past videos. Those aren't going to be the same. However, they may be somewhat similar in salient ways. Uh, but differences include the fact that, of course, we take in information from many different modalities. We, as we'll know from 
uh, our, our, our Buddhist Dharma, uh, take in visual information, auditory, uh, touch, taste, smell, all of this kind of information as well as language, and we, in our minds, integrate this into a sort of an understanding of the world that's, that's holistic, that involves all of them. Clearly, that's not going to be the case with a chat program. Uh, I, I believe some of them now have some visual ability, but, but we're just going to get the start of that. Now, we might wonder, is there some independent support of this claim that we have something like these chatbots within us? Well, recent experiments with artificial intelligences uh, constructed along these lines hooked up to MRI machines have been able to actually look into human brains and recover internal speech and visual information from those brains. So in other words, the people will be, humans will be uh, put in an MRI machine and given a, a series of words to go over and think about or a, an image to, to view. And this artificial intelligence is able to look into the activity, the brain activity, the neural activity, the sort of neural firings, and again, recover a significant amount of verbal information out of those brains. So this shows that at sort of a 10,000 foot level, if you like, a very high level, artificial neural networks can actually look at human neural networks and tell what they are thinking internally, at least in certain uh, uh, controlled experiments. Now this is all uh, quite mind-blowing, I think, uh, but it should inform the way we look at the world. And, and I think this is only going to be uh, advancing quite quickly, so we'll probably be learning more about this kind of thing in, in, in years to come. Okay, so now what does all this have to do with Buddhist practice? Well, so we sit down to meditation. Uh, what is the first thing that we're liable to see once we sit down on our cushion and the, 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 the world quiets around us? Well, we'll begin to hear this internal chatter. This internal chatter starts up. We'll begin to think about the, what happened to us yesterday. We'll begin to think about perhaps what we have to do tomorrow. We'll begin to have an inner commentary on what's going on around us in the room. Now, this internal chatter of ours is going to be more complicated than the information we might get from a chatbot. And in particular, it's going to be multimodal, as we've spoken of before. So we're not just going to have words going on in our minds or an internal voice, although that might be part of it, but we're going to also have images and sounds and feelings and senses of movement and action, things that we don't get from uh, text on a screen. So there's going to be more complexity in the case of a human, in, case, in our own case. But we can understand this phenomenon as not being unlike that of listening to a sort of a chattering AI program, something that's in our minds that's producing a bunch of chatter about what's around us. In other words, contextually appropriate kinds of, of words and, and sentences that just sort of go on and on without our necessarily having to do anything about it. And these may indeed include nasty and sarcastic comments as our original uh, question was all about. The question that I started this video with was asking, about the kinds of things where, you know, we have this kind of nasty internal chatter and what do we do about it? Indeed, at times, this internal chatter can be obsessive and ruminative and, as we say, nasty, difficult. And in that case, it might be called papancha or what's known as mental proliferation in Buddhism. Mental proliferation is one of the hallmarks of dukkha or of of, of suffering in, in Buddhism. It's, it's perhaps even the, the main source of suffering for many of us, this kind of, you know, ceaseless internal chatter that, that isn't useful, that isn't helpful. So maybe we listen to an internal voice that tells us that we're no good, or that laments some past event that we've been through, or that uh, eggs us on to, to uh, revenge or anger, or hatred with other people. And what we're tasked to do in meditation is to try to let that all go, is to uh, try to foster the idea that you don't have to believe everything you think, as the, the famous uh, claim goes. You don't have to believe everything that you think. That the thoughts in the mind are just that. They're just thoughts in the mind. They're 
passing events. They're like the clouds in the sky. They come in one ear and go out the other. That is, in, in, in meditation, we're tasked with separating uh, what we think of as ourselves from our internal chatter. That our internal chatter is not who we are. The words that come up in our minds are not who we are. Indeed, sometimes we'll find ourselves thinking things that are quite horrible, that are quite at odds with what we think we ought to be considering. This happens to all of us. And indeed, something similar even happened to the Buddha. In one of his early, uh, in his, one of his sermons, in one of his discussions, uh, one of his suttas, the early suttas, he discusses how before he was enlightened, when he was uh, a younger uh, man, he realized that there were thoughts coming into his head of different types, that there were actually two kinds of thoughts. There were thoughts that were skillful and helpful and useful to him, but there were also plenty of thoughts that were unskillful and unhelpful and not useful. And so he took it upon himself to try to take the, the strength away from the thoughts that were unskillful, to try to act, behave, think in ways that made those thoughts come up less often. And it's very difficult, I would submit, to do that if we identify ourselves with everything that we think. If we think that all of the thoughts coming up in our minds are really expressive of who we are, we're not liable to be able to let them go very easily. Once we see them as separate from who we are, understand them as something that's separate from ourselves, that's not ourself, that's not self, then it's easier to allow them simply to go on their merry way. So here's a meditation exercise for the next time that you sit down to meditate. Frame your internal chatter as being produced by your own, as it were, internal chatbot. A sort of a, a very voluble, always chattering kind of artificial intelligence. Of course, it's a natural one in this case, but it's the same kind of thing. It's just let's say, obsessively completing sentences predictively based upon your present context and your history. In Buddhism, we might say your karmic history. So given all of your past and given your context, it's going to just sort of spit out sentences. But if we see this as something that's not who we are, but that's just sort of some internal part of our mind that's just sort of obsessively uh, chattering away, we can begin to to perhaps relax around it, give it, as it were, less emotional power over us, let it be, let it do its thing, and in time it will quiet down, and we will be able to get back to the business of actually meditating and of overcoming dukkha. And so I think we can come to see how understanding this, artif this artificial intelligence, all this information we've gotten from AI and chat programs, large language models, can inform our sense of the self, that is to say, non-self, and become pr part of our non-self practice, part of our practice towards wisdom. And actually, I did a, a recent video on how AI and non Buddhist non-self seem to go together, and I'll leave a link to that video up here on the screen if you haven't seen it or would like to see it again. If you're getting something out of these videos of mine, consider taking a look at my Patreon page, which is linked here on the screen and down below in the notes, and see if you want to help support the channel and the work that we're all doing here. Thanks so much, and we'll catch you on the next video. And meanwhile, all of you, be well.